And like I said, if you don't want to be recorded, just make sure you uh, black out your picture. So anyway, Ellen, do you have anything you want to say before we get started? Uh, no, not really. Happy to see um, everyone showing up um, on this kind of Tuesday at the beginning of the summer and hope we can answer some questions and get you ready to get out into the field. So mostly, uh, the, we're going to have mostly um, uh, PowerPoint and some background as the first part of this webinar. Uh, we'll take a very short break after that, and then we'll um, I'll do a demo going through a lot of the features of Strabo, not all of them because there's there's way too many at this point, but I'll be pointing you where you can get help and and uh, learn other things. Uh, anytime somebody has a question, go ahead and and paste it um, in the chat and uh, Ellen's going to be monitoring that while I present, and she'll interrupt me if there's some key question that I need to answer right away or something I said that was completely wrong, uh, which we'll have to worry about as well. Anyway, I'm glad to see everybody here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and, and get started. Okay. And a second. Is everybody seeing a full workshop screen for Strava Spot Field Workshop June 6? We can see it, Doug. Great. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, just want to give you an intro to what we're doing with Strava Spot and mostly focus in today on the field application or field app that we have. Um, so what is Strabo Spot? Um, it's an effort that we started about um, 10 years ago. It was connected with the EarthCube uh, program at NSF to try to bring cyber infrastructure and geology closer together. And um, we got started in this. Uh, Basil Tickoff and I ran a a uh, workshop for the field geology, structural geology, tectonics community, and was we're really trying to, to figure out what was needed. And what was needed was some kind of database and way to share field data. Um, so what is Strabo Spot? It's what came out of that. And, and it really has several different components and different ways of being looked at. Uh, Probably the easiest way to start thinking about it, it's an app or app and applications uh, that have databases. And those databases allow you to collect, store, share, and search for geologic data. We'll touch on all of that as we go through. So it's aimed at field geologists or the laboratory geologist who wants to make observations and share information. Um, out of to, to make that happen, we've gotten software that's designed for field work, microstructural work, and experimental work. The field geology part, uh, we've had several awards that have been funded to do structural geology, petrology, sedimentary geology, trying to bring in a lot of those aspects. Uh, the microstructural part has been funded too to try to get microstructures of uh, thin section and associated data into the system. Uh, we'll see examples of that later on, and then next week will be all about the microstructural part. And then we're just starting work on experimental, uh, working with the experimental uh, deformation community to, to work uh, with them. I think the, the big word on the end of this is workflows. And that's why we, we've always focused on is trying to understand the geologist or petrologist or whomever's workflow so that uh, the, the system works for them and, and doesn't put too many undue burdens on them. Um, the whole system is open source and open API. We don't require any anything special to interact with it. If you want to store data, you have to register, but otherwise you don't. Um, and our, our real goals at the end of the day are to make geological data 
uh, fair, which is findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And one of the big bugaboos for field geology is the reproducibility, just allowing, allowing people to document their observations uh, and their workflow so thoroughly that, that we really think about the field geology being very reproducible. Uh, the initial uh, development started uh, in 2014 after a field R RCN that Maddie Mukherjee uh, led. And uh, it was a, I didn't go, but a lot of people did. And it was a very fabulous session with the other Strava Spot PIs on, on thinking about what we needed. And the first ideas were fairly uh, broad that we would need an app that could work on both a phone and a tablet and should run on iOS and Android. Um, so we were sort of moving into the phone design at that point. Uh, we wanted the application to interact with everything that you could, you could do with a, a portable device, GPS, camera, accelerometer, et cetera, et cetera. It had to work in both online and offline mode. So some way to work on it when you were connected to the internet. And then if you got offline, you still had all the capabilities of, of using the software, using the app. And uh, after the field seminar that, that Maddie, was, Maddie led, then uh, we developed a rudimentary interface, started the testing in, in 2015, and it just worked on from there. The first uh, production version was released at the um, GSA annual meeting in Seattle. I believe that was 2017. So what is the field app? And a lot of you um, have used all these different things, your field book, a GPS, map board that has a couple different map types on it, Brunt and Compass. And what we wanted to do was we wanted to pull all that information into an application and use all of the abilities of mobile devices to do these things. The temptation at first is to basically just try to make a iPad or Android version of a map or a camera or a field book. And that's that's fine, but that really kind of missed the point of what you really want to do with it. Um, if you've worked with GIS systems, you know you have this incredible database that you can get behind. Uh, you also can do a lot of work with uh, imagery and other things coming into the system. Uh, you can use 20 or 50 or any number of base maps that you want that are all referenced in the same position, et cetera. And more so as we move on in, the, in geology, we're doing things like structure from motion, where we create uh, our base maps on the fly in the field. And so we wanted to be able to do all of these things, have some accommodation for it, my interest is I just want to do field geology better and uh, really use every technique that we can in the field to collect data, document it, and, and share it. That's, that's kind of where we're headed with Strapo Spot ultimately. So all of these different activities we want to bring in. Um, Strapo Spot is based on the idea of a spot. A uh, spot is just a point where you can reference. I hope everybody sees my cursor. Is my cursor showing up okay, Ellen? Over the map? I'm muted. Yeah, it's showing up just a little red dot. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, the idea is you want to go out in the field and take your, your uh, tablet with you, your mobile device, uh, from that, you want to be able to collect information. Uh, you want to keep track of that across scales, all the way from a, a map scale here that's about 50 or 60 kilometers wide to the samples you collect. But then you want to keep following your samples like here and here. You want to follow that through thin sections and other types of measurements, chemical measurements or uh, modal abundances and uh, uh, X-ray backscatter images. So the idea is that we have these things we call spots, and spots are just a point of information 
that has some sort of physical scale associated with it. So this spot right here has a measurement in the field, a sample, et cetera. This spot down in the middle part here, again, we follow through with the thin section, et cetera. So that's what the, the fundamental part of this is, is the spot concept that you have a point with information. That spot um, are reference data that contain other things. So it could be a polygon pointer line. Uh, you can have spots within spots. And kind of the architecture I'm showing here flows throughout the entire app. So any spot can contain information like its notes. Uh, you can take measurements. Uh, you can take samples and, and take photographs very easily. So you can collect the data, the sorts of data you normally collect. But we also wanted to add the power that related information could go together. So we developed something we called tags. Tags we just think of as kind of the sticky note you throw on the side of your, um, your rock or your observation. And maybe you have the same sticky note on a lot of things. So for example, uh, we can add tags at any point through here. Uh, this first tag might be the geologic unit. The second tag might be uh, something to do with the location. And the third tag contain information. One of the things that we uh, really wanted to get going initially with it is being able to collect images, take outcrop photos, or bring that sort of information in. This is really the key of, of what you want to do in the field. Uh, people take millions of pictures, but they're just hard to relate to everything. We wanted to make all that data collection and point seamless so that everything you did here in the field was related to a spot that you could explore. And with images, we know that people want to take their images wherever they come from, and they want to use them to map on. So we actually have an area, a, a part of Strava spot where the image is used for a bit as a base map. So that image is geo-referenced wherever you took your photo or a sketch or whatever you, you brought in. Maybe you're bringing in a cross section. Anything can be used for a base map pretty much. Um, and then you're able to describe the rocks that are there, take more notes, and maybe you're going to take more images. So in here, you, we have this uh, divide here where we have the spots. So one spot in the field can grow into many spots underneath it, uh, where we have categories of information we're collecting, samples, notes, images, et cetera, and then all of the attributes that you take, uh, rock type information, more photos, samples, measurements, et cetera. So you, you have this arrangement of spots and attributes that collect together with them and go with them. And again, this we're trying to follow this all the way from the field image down to a thin section or a photo micrograph. So what we have for Strabospot is what we'll call the Strabospot ecosystem at this point. Ecosystem is, is kind of a new way of talking about uh, collections of apps and data together. Uh, NSF is pushing this, and, and um, they actually just had a call out for uh, uh, cyber ecosystems to be developed. So Strabo Spot, and we'll get to this later, has sort of the main, your main login and your main portal that you go to that's the database and management part of it. That connects directly with the Strabo Spot 2 web, uh, sorry, mobile app runs on both Android and iOS. And this is going to be the focus of this week, these two things and how they're connected. Then we also have the Strabo Micro standalone platform independent app. And that's tuned for bringing in all kinds of data, uh, basically at the thin section level and below. And what we want to be able to do, what we can do now is uh, have this interact very well with the Strabo Spot system, the backend database. What we're working on is to make sure that there's total connectivity between the field app and the standalone lab app. 
And we're also working uh, with the experimental uh, deformation community to bring those experiments, uh, experimental information in. So ultimately, experimental data, field data, and microdata can all be combined together in kind of a big integrated package. That's that's sort of where we're sitting with this. That we the, the vision going in the future. Uh, things have been connected already to Strabo Spot. So Rick Almendinger's Stereo Net Mobile. Uh, app, very powerful, important app. You can work directly in it using Strabo data. You can go from Strabo, say a map like this, to a stereo net. But Almendinger is also built in native functionality for Strabo spot into the stereo net program. Uh, you can actually connect to the database with it. So this is a, a, a nice connection uh, that was made by Rick. And then we also have uh, something we call Strabo Tools, which is a standalone app that Alan Glazner spearheaded. And it does things like uh, interpret uh, fabrics and rocks, does color indexes, and a color or a modal abundance uh, module is about to be released on that. So there are other apps that go into the Strabo Spot ecosystem as well. All of these will work together. So you have the field app that you come in, you collect your data and everything you hope pulls together with that. And you enter spots that contain information that may contain samples that then contain other spots that you then work into more and more data. And these things are all uh, linked hierarchically, uh, but they're all uh, independent. The motion or the movement from uh, a spot to all the information it might be associated with is done as a seamless uh, exercise. And we'll demo that a little bit later. So again, we're starting out with the field app and that's what you're seeing here is, is a capture of a page from uh, a, a map area in Colorado um, that uh, shows the, the interface, uh, the, uh, iPad interface or Android interface too. And what I've done here is I've selected a spot right here that has some bedding measurements in it, uh, no photos, and then it has a geologic unit tag. So we get this notebook view off on the right-hand side, and then we can work with our project and aspects of our project here under settings and preferences on the left-hand side, including uh, changing the project, logging in, logging out, backing it up. Um, you can get lists of spots and all your pictures. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later on about custom maps that you bring in, um, and then a few of these other things as we go through. So the idea here is that all of your data entry is pretty well self-contained. You always have the map visible that you see in the center part. These are some navigation tools that we'll go over. And this is how you add spot data down here. The notebook here on the right-hand side, uh, basically we have a lot of tools that go with it. Uh, these are the basic tools, tagging, measurements, sampling, notes, photography, and sketching. Again, we'll see those a little bit later. Uh, so we have these as sort of the fundamental aspects that you come in. Uh, you can actually click on uh, a more tab with the uh, tools and pull up about 20 other tools for this. So what the fundamental starting point for the field app is, is the map. And so that's, uh, this is a map here just showing some of the aspects that we work with. Uh, you can see up at the top here, I'll just go through these menus, um, uh, settings, maps, attributes. That's what this little home button does. Uh, then there's action on the map itself, uh, zooming to spots, saving for offline use, and doing some other things like lassoing measurements for stereo net. That's what the three dot menu here is. Uh, the star menu here allows you to change how you're symbolizing your spots and the information on the map. We'll get into that. And then the lower one here is all the different back map layers you, you have. Uh, 
Strabo spot comes with four default layers, which is uh, one provided by the Mapbox group, the Mapbox Toto, two provided by the Mapbox group, Mapbox Toto, Topo, and Mapbox satellite images. Uh, OpenStreetMap, we support that. And then MacroStrat has a web service where they serve a uh, large uh, scale geologic background map. And you can also add custom base maps that we'll get to. Uh, as we move across to the bottom left, uh, we have a toggle that shows the current location. You can click this and it, it takes you to your current location, displays a, a location for uh, 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 many seconds and then turns that off. Then along the bottom right here is adding spots, points, lines, and polygons. Uh, and then lines and polygons can actually be made smooth if you want to draw in, in, in some kind of detail. As we go up here, uh, the connectivity is shown here, whether you're online or offline, and then opening the notebook view, you trigger from right here. So um, now we get into the field app some more. And just looking at the notebook view and the map visualization, I'll show you a little later how you change the colors here and the things that are expressed on this map, the different types of lines and that. But this is what you might, might end up with as your notebook view. And with this spot here selected, uh, getting some information about it. Uh, notes that come in, measurements that you take, and then photos that come in. Uh, you see this thing in the bottom of using it as an image-based map. We'll get to that a little bit later on. Uh, but this is just the richness of what you can document and, and the sort of richness of view that you can get uh, in the mapping part of this. Again, all the information you can bring in. So the Strabo field app sits there and it can use all the different things that you have in your iPad. It can have different maps and you can take notes. It has GPS to locate you. You can take pictures and you can take measurements as well and observations. So basically, sorry. So where does all that information go? Well, it goes into the app, it's put into a database and then you can upload it to the Strabo Spot um, website and to the database there. It'll upload all your data, your images, pictures, et cetera. And this is an example of somebody logged in and a couple of their projects, sort of the big container uh, for data in Strabo as a project that would be like your thesis or a uh, uh, basically a goal oriented set of mapping or field observations you are making. And then underneath your projects, you have individual uh, data sets that may be the sorts of information you're collecting. Um, and uh, you can divide this up into uh, whatever you want. You get the number of spots or features that have them in there. Uh, you're able to make your data public or private uh, with this little toggle. And public means anybody can see it. It can be discovered by a search. Uh, private means uh, it's limited. You, only you can view it and, and know that it's there. And there are some editing capabilities with that. But that's where your data goes. And you can manage your data here. You can edit or delete uh, any data set or project as, uh, that you want to uh, work with. Uh, you can download it in a lot of different formats. We'll see later. The editing here from the website actually is, an, is a web-based uh, editor. Uh, right now, it works exactly like the Strabo One mobile app works. It's written on the same code base. Uh, we're just getting, uh, hopefully, we're going to be testing in beta mode the uh, online version of Strabo Two. But again, you have all the power of, of entering information. For example, if you made a map and you had a lot of digital photos and strikes and dips measured, you could make a project where uh, you edited that totally online from a web browser and enter your information in that way. 
So uh, the website, as I said, uh, you can make your spots private or public. Uh, this is an example of a search at the main website where we're looking for strat columns and uh, uh, looks like uh, for, at this time there were 55 different projects that had strat columns, uh, 96 data sets, and, and close to 2,000 spots associated with them. All of these are ones that were discovered um, by the search uh, system. Uh, any that are kept private are not displayed, so we wouldn't be able to know how many of those have come in or how many of those there are. So again, the Strabo Spot field app, think of it not just as, as this app that you're collecting information with, but think about it as this whole data workflow. Uh, you're doing things in the field exactly like you would want to use uh, your current equipment. You would take pictures, take strikes and dips, uh, use your GPS, different base maps. You're going to work on all that. But it's all going to come back to this big container, to this Strabo Spot. Uh, website or Strava Spot backend database that you create a login for and you control your data at that point. Uh, you can display it, other people discover it. You can just work on it yourself till you're ready to let it uh, be displayed. Part of this is to help NSF data reporting requirements, but part of this is just to allow people to do this sort of work and, and bring the information in. Um, I'll just make a quick uh, note here. This partially historical, <clears throat> I hope soon, is that <clears throat> the interface that I've been showing you so far has been the Strava Spot 2 interface. There was a Strava Spot, there is a Strava Spot 1 interface that was fully designed for phone use. Um, we found out about five years ago, a lot of people were using tablets, so we did a redesign effort into Strava 2 that created this much richer multi-windowed uh, approach to showing data and always showing a map. Uh, we're moving everything into Strabo too soon, including the web interface. And we're hoping uh, this summer or in the fall to phase out the Strabo one interface. That's still available for uh, iPhones and Android phones. The Strabo Spot 2, and it also, Strabo one runs on any tablet. The Strava Spot 2 at this point is running on uh, just tablets. So the Strava Spot 2 field app, again, we've shown a little bit of this before, but again, just to show you some of the things, uh, on the left, you can do the home screen, but on the right, you can open up for any spot the notebook view. So the idea here is that you can display this and it looks like you're field book, but supercharged with notes, measurements, photos, et cetera. So you're able to bring that uh, information in. So you can see what you have already and scroll through that if needed, but then you can do more data entry at that spot if you want to. One of the things that we've uh, worked quite a bit on here is bringing in measurement. Um, information. And we have something that we call a QEM or quick entry modal. Uh, these are little um, modals or little, little windows that appear that you can interact with to enter specific data types. Uh, so for example, this is the measurement uh, data type that's connected to the compass uh, in the uh, tablet. Uh, you can take a strike and dip um, or a trend and plunge. Uh, one of the things that we'll talk about later is you can actually develop templates for particular data types. Uh, and again, you can set the information about your observation. For example, the quality of measurement defaults do not record, recorded, but you could put any sort of, of quantitative or qualitative measure on that that you wanted. So when you look at these uh, sections over here on the right, and you look at these icons down below, that's where you would get modals coming up the, to enter, enter, enter information. And then you can also edit it on this right-hand notebook panel as well. Uh, one of the things we talked about too was bringing images in and using images as base maps. 
So this is uh, showing a field locale where uh, the person taking the data took a picture, but what they wanted to do was now annotate that picture and map on it. So they can use images base map by a little toggle here. And then they're able to add, for example, this uh, area that they want to take a sample from, uh, probably chipped out of the rock, and they're able to uh, document that information. Again, you can work at as many scales as you want. The sample that's taken could have spots in it that could go into Strabo Micro that you could keep going down in detail or physical scale completely seamlessly. There is, um, unlike a GIS with Strabo Spot, there is no intended scale of use. It's all any scale you want with this. So this is showing the image base map component as we come in. Just to, to back up a little bit about uh, how we got to these interfaces and, and applications uh, and what was driving us. And, and basically from the start, uh, the PIs, which initially were Basil, Tickoff, Julie Newman, myself, and when we started with the EarthScope part of this, uh, we built it by the community. We let the community design what we had uh, doing workshops, field trips, talks, webinars, outreach. We had COVID response efforts. And the key here is really this middle part. Follow the workflow of the researchers. Uh, make it comfortable that, for them in the field and lab. And we would test these things with different groups uh, of people coming in. Uh, we held specific uh, field trips and and workshops for this. And we really view this as important in training geologists into the future. It's used worldwide now. We wanted, we designed it with teaching in mind. Part of what we do to enforce the community aspect is all the code is maintained at GitHub. Anybody can get it, look at it, uh, do whatever they want with it. Uh, we have capabilities. This is the test flight. Uh, uh, logo from Apple. We have ability to put beta software out for people to test and get feedback. And then this talk that we're doing today and a lot of other things up to, I think we have 50 different videos that are up on YouTube. So you can go watch what we're doing and, and get some help that way. So the community-based effort um, is things like this. This is 20 plus people on a workshop that we held for petrology. This is out in the White Mountains, California. This is a, most of the participants, but not all. It was held in 2018. Uh, this work, particular workshop is what uh, basically propelled us into the Strabo II design. And we spent five days with these folks, four or five days with these folks, basically picking their brain, doing work, and, and figuring out how we should be doing this work. What we wanted to do is fit the user's workflow. And we do this at every stage. Uh, just this year, uh, in January, there was a uh, workshop on TEFRA data collection that was held with the IAPSI meeting in New Zealand. Ellen is pictured here in the center frame. And again, this is where a lot of field uh, geologists, field TEFRA chronologists, and TEFRA workers came out uh, to use Strabo Spot and make suggestions about collecting data in the field. Uh, it's built for teaching. So we take students out in field camps. I noted earlier that uh, we do the beta testing uh, on Strabo, mostly at the KU field camp for students. But the idea here is that the teaching uh, aspect is critical and that the data collection in Strabo Spot basically follows how you would want students to make observations in the field, what you'd want them to remember and what you'd want them to collect data with. So this is a typical picture of the KU camp now, uh, a TA on the left, students on the center and right, all working. Uh, to collect their data in the field and, and trying to document their field observations. Uh, I use this for teaching students do everything and hand in everything online now, and it's, it's a great, great time saver for a lot of us. Uh, the other part of the community aspect I think that we have to emphasize is that the Strabo Spot system has this community input, 
but we also go through peer review. So our first paper was in 2019, uh, describing the data system for structural geology and the, the basic data system of images, tags, et cetera, uh, what a spot is and how it's defined. And then a couple of years ago or a year and a half ago, we published a paper on the SED part. You'll hear a lot more about the sedimentology and stratigraphy part um, on uh, Thursday. And notice that there are some similar author authors between these two papers, but really uh, the people involved with the development, the logic and the field part are the people who are developing this and we're using their input and their they're basically given credit for, for how they've well they've done with that and how thoroughly they've dealt with it. So it's community-based. There are a lot of different institutions uh, that are involved in uh, the work. And there's also a lot of different cyber infrastructure groups, uh, EarthCAM and AIDA, um, the EPOS, a European Plate Observing System, we're working with them, Open Topography, Geochron, SCEC. Uh, Rick Almendinger, et cetera. So we're, we're working with a lot of different people. Uh, after we started working on the TEFRA part, uh, Alaska Volcano Observatory actually started using Strapo Spot uh, at the USGS for their data collection. And just kind of as a, a, a separate pitch, uh, four years ago, uh, we were involved with uh, the TEFRA community, got our involvement, or five years ago, got our involvement started with them on collecting TEFRA data and, and documenting samples. We hadn't really put together a single TEFRA workflow uh, initially, but we worked with them to put that in place so they can go in and collect samples, uh, put those samples in terms of data that they collect about their uh, about volcanic sequences. So again, we worked with them to bring this information in and to make uh, make it workable for them. Right now, we've grown. Uh, the, the system contains over 810,000 spots. There's uh, approaching 6,000 registered users of Strava Spot at this point. Uh, the distribution of public projects is pretty much worldwide. Uh, we Whoever wants to use and enter data can, can bring it in this way. Uh, again, these are only the public ones. We don't know how many projects are private. Um, and then uh, we're continuing our development and moving forward with the Strava Spot 2 field app. Um, earlier this year, we released the Android capability on tablets. Uh, We've started the mobile design phase and gotten a good idea on that. This is, for example, the, the idea of what we would have for a phone-sized tablet, or sorry, a phone-sized device. Uh, Ellen is uh, developing these sorts of things uh, and doing a super job trying to get this in. And we've also uh, released uh, the said strap module on all, on all platforms. Uh, our plan for this year, uh, this calendar year, is, is getting a phone implementation going for both iOS and Android uh, and getting things seamless with Strabo Micro. Um, we also uh, are have proposals in to do various things. One is what I'll call group workflows, working together on a project. We'll talk about that later. And then we ultimately want to get us a, a Strabo 2 version of the sedimentary geology interface uh, put in that does a lot more uh, interactivity with data collection and, and easier uh, attributing of data items. So that's a lot of the things that are planned right now and we're moving forward with. So that, that uh, concludes my uh, intro uh, little bit here. Uh, if you're wondering where the name Strabo came from, uh, Strabo was a G Greek geographer uh, who lived uh, about at the boundary of uh, before and after the Common Era. Uh, and uh, uh, he was perhaps the first tectonicist relating uh, motion of islands uh, and uplift and subsidence to earthquakes and volcanoes. All right. Well, that is...
it. I'll stop share right now. And we'll take a few minutes of questions or anything that people have put on chat for a few minutes. Uh, we'll take a break after that for just a couple of minutes, and then we'll go back to a live demo. Ellen, any questions that we should deal with at this point? Uh, we just had one pop in. It says, is there a way to do manual image georeferencing within Strava Spot? Um, no, uh, you can't. You can bring in images, but they have to be pre-registered. So you would have to register them in a GIS like ArcGIS or QGIS. There is an online um, referencing system called um, uh, Map Warper. Uh, it's at mapwarper.net, and the information about that is in, you can find that in Strava Spot. Um, and uh, uh, we, um, you can bring that in, and I'll show later on how you do that into uh, enter your map, your reference maps in that you can use as a base map. I'll show that a little bit later with the app. So there's no built-in utility, but there are plenty of utilities that you can use. Anything that will make a geotiff um, can be used to get a base map into Strapa Spot. Any other questions? Uh, we got a couple more in the chat. One is just how do you keep students thinking about geology rather than tech minutia when you're like working in those kind of large groups of students? Exactly. And that's why this is so much better because they have everything sitting in front of them, the map, their data, their information. They don't see the tech. The tech is just there for them to use. Um, you know, to me, asking that question is how do you keep students uh, from fixating on their clipboard when they're in the field? That's not really a question. Uh, that, that's a tool that they use. And Strapo Spot now is the way to collect data. It's it's a tool. It's not uh, the end all be all. There's a little bit of glitz, um, I think, for a lot of us on having a mobile app uh, for people who grew up on paper maps. But um, this is the way people work now. So I think for students, it's it's actually an easy enough thing, um, not too much of a problem at all. Uh, this kind of is the backup a little bit on that. Um, for a long time, we taught GIS in the field with ARC uh, Esri products or ARC map. Um, and it always took uh, a full day to actually get people working in the GIS and, and actually being able to do something. At that point, that was really tech. I mean, that was, that was concentrating on the tech part. Uh, now we spend about 30 minutes with the students uh, in a cabin, getting them onto their iPads uh, to get them started. And then they're just using the app in the field. Uh, the tech aspect is just built in. It's kind of gone because of that. What else, Ellen? Oh, we've got some good ones coming in. Um, we have one that says, I would like to add spots with samples to my maps, but the samples I take are geochemical measurements of hot springs. I find that the existing data input tab and sample tab don't have functional categories for this. Uh, will there be a possibility to have a tab that you can customize the fields of? So um, customizing fields and building new fields uh, uh, is an easy thing to do in Strava Spot. And developers, um, uh, we have a developer, uh, Jessica Novak, who was in in the 2014 version. One of the first things she did was to think about exactly that aspect. So there's a, we have a couple of different ways. The easiest way is to use uh, something called Kobo Toolbox. We can talk about that later, but it allows you to create those forms. And that's how we all create our forms and anybody can do it. We've had uh, people use that for lots of different purposes from uh, neotectonics, putting forms together, et cetera. Adding that information in is, is very easy to do in Strava Spot. So you can contact us if you want to, if you want to get modules in. I was gonna say, I think to be pretty clear about that. Yeah, you'd have to kind of contact us at Strabo and we can get it in. I don't think there's really a way for individuals to kind of add a tab, but 
if someone's making a tab, um, it might be something that's useful for other people. And so we're happy to have the conversations. You can add uh, spots that are not under any of the categories as a custom feature, but you just don't have the big menus of items that, that go through uh, the fixed vocabulary that goes with it. And it's really that fixed vocabulary that I think helps lead students through making observations. Um, we have a question about how much control over camera parameters, exposure, focus, stuff like that are available when taking pictures with Strabo Spot. Uh, Strabo Spot pops up uh, interfaces with the camera, so you have all the control that you would normally have with your camera. Um, if you want and it's too clunky for you, you can actually just take the picture uh, of the of whatever uh, using the camera, whatever camera you want, and bring it in. You can import pictures uh, into Strabo. I'll show that later as well. Um, Let's do like one or two more, and then we're going to take a five-minute break. Um, just have a shout out that ASU is using it for field camps and been mapping for the past three years using it. Um, do you have any comments on the preferred tablet platform for Strabo Spot, Apple versus Android, older versus newer, um, just tablet uh, quality of GPS sensor? Yep. Um, I You know, I don't want to endorse any particular product, but uh, the Apple products are all very, very, very standardized. Uh, so they're all the same as far as Strabo is concerned. And as far as people using them is concerned, the the accuracy, et cetera, there have been papers, uh, Almond Digger's written a couple of papers and other people on these things. Uh, so the Apple ones are, are fine. Uh, Android right now, we're not supporting uh, the compass on it simply because uh, there's a lot of different implementations in different versions of Android about the compass work. So um, my feeling about the map, GPS, et cetera, is all, is all fine. It's just the compass is the one thing that's different. And that's basically because Apple is completely standardized and iOS is completely standardized, whereas Android is not. So for the KU group, we use uh, iPads uh, for the, the field work. The only problem with iPads is they're more expensive and to get the GPS built into the iPad, you have to buy a cellular, cellular ready iPad, even though you're not using the cell part of it. One more. Um, just trying to see how to phrase these as some questions. Um, we just had some comments about uh, the orientation, like actually using the app um, Strabo and just how they're seeing some maybe different orientations on Clino versus Strabo versus other things. So I don't know if you want to comment on just like accuracy of that. So when we test the uh, Strabo compass and the Strabo app, uh, we test it using Rick Almendinger's StereoNet mobile. And we can reproduce StereoNet mobile. Uh, I've used StereoNet mobile a lot. And um, we tested it in the field. We test it on its own. But then we always do a direct comparison with both of them running uh, on, with StereoNet mobile versus the iPad. So that's what we go through. It's, it's as reliable as the... Compass is, and, and Almendinger has a paper he wrote a few years ago on, on compasses, and I would, I would reference that. All right, well, we'll come back in five minutes or 12.57 uh, uh, on Central Time. Uh, we'll come back, and then I'll do a, a live demo. If you want to keep adding questions, that'd be great, and we'll try to uh, try to look at those in the chat as we can. All right, so just a few minute break here, and then we'll be right back. And the channel's open, and if you unmute and want to talk amongst yourselves, go for it.
Well, hi, everybody. Uh, we're back. Um, does uh, everybody see what looks like uh, a screen with uh, uh, a Strabo map on it? Yes, we can see the iPad. Doug. Okay. I'm going to get a project going here in a second, but right before we start uh, this part of the demo, uh, Ellen's going to answer a couple questions people had. Oh, yeah, I, I was going to put them in the chat, but um, we had one question about can you import shape files to Strabo? And yes, you can do that. Um, in order to do that, some of the pre-field stuff um, you should just do on the website. So that's where you're going to upload the custom maps. And that's where you can also bring in shape files. And then you basically assign what project you want that brought into. Um, and then you'll have to re-download that from the server, actually on your iPad, if you want to view them in the app. But yeah, that's definitely doable. Um, and then we had another question about importing data from other mapping applications, such as FieldMove or Clino. Um, and I don't think that you can. Um, if you, I guess if you could export as a shape file from either of those, you could maybe then bring it um, in. Um, but yeah, as of right now, we don't really have movability between those. Um, Sneer, I see yours, um, but I'm going to come back to it a little bit because there's an easier one after it, which is can you export the structural data to KMZ? Yes, you can export everything um, as the shape files. You can export them as KMZs. You can export um, just as Excel sheets. You can also just export a PDF of all of your notes and images and measurements and everything. Um, and I've actually talked to some people and they sometimes use that to just kind of command F their own field notes when they want to look through things. Um, okay, but going back to Sneers, um, he had a question, um, sort of, I'll just read his whole thing. Um, I feel like more efficient and seamless data sharing as part of collaboration on field mapping projects is one of the um, biggest potential upsides of data, digital field data collection, um, but obviously syncing in real time is a challenge in the field um, slash prohibitive. So how do multiple users work together in Strabo Spot now? Um, and what are the challenges and best practices that have been developed? Um, so go ahead. I, I was just going to say the main kind of workaround um, that I've used and I know other people use is you basically make one project on one person's account or you make like a kind of group account on Strabo Spot. And then you have everyone log into the app on that account. Um, if you're doing this, then like really the key part to doing this is make sure everyone is working in a separate database. Um, because then once you upload that to the server, it's all going to be stored on one project and you can see it all together. Um, but if you all were working on like the default database, you're going to overwrite each other. Um, and then Doug can speak or yeah data set um Doug can speak a little bit more to it but yeah I think moving forward some of our goals are just getting a little bit better group workflows and we put in some grants for that that's a really good question I'll I'll deal with that a little bit um as we go through here but yeah that's that's probably the most requested thing and we've put in a couple proposals on that uh just kind of to lead off some questions this kind of is a uh, preview here. I'm gonna. I'm aiming for going about 30, 35 minutes on this, and then leaving time for questions. Um, I'm gonna show you a couple things now where you can get answers, uh, other questions if you want, and and do work. This is the strabospot.org website. Uh, this is the home screen, um, and then you have different navigation uh, that you can go through on this. Uh, your account, I'm logged into this, or I guess I'm not logged in. Um, I am now. Uh, under your account is where you can control a lot of things about what's going on. So you can log in, log out, you can load shape files, and you can do a lot of different other things with versioning changes in My Maps. Uh, My Maps under here is where you are able to upload uh, geotiffs, um, georeference maps, and, and share those. Again, you can let other people use them, or you can uh, making them public, or you can make them private. 
but the other thing that we have on here, uh, other things is uh, availability of, of the app, uh, some talk about hardware that you might use, the search capability, which I really won't go over, but we have, have data worldwide at this point. And then um, um, probably the biggest thing here is the help system. And there's a lot of help. Um, the Strava One documentation is very complete about the Strava system. Uh, Strava 2 has its own help system now, but it doesn't repeat some of the, the starting material from Strava 1. And then on YouTube, we have a whole bunch, bunch of help videos that you can go to look at and see different aspects. So if you're, if you're interested in getting help for Strava 2, um, you can just click on this and then you get a PDF that leads you through all the different aspects of Strabo 2. So that's an important, important resource. All right, so I'm gonna go into Strabo now. I've got a project loaded I'm gonna go out of. I'm logged in as myself. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is, is start a new project. Uh, so I go under my Strabo spot, start a new project. And one of the things that we do is ensure that you don't lose your data. Uh, so what a new project does is it overwrites the old one. So the first thing you can do is uh, you can save your current data to the device or upload it. Um, and then the project information showed over here on the left. It's a little funny simply because uh, you can't see where my finger goes, but um, I can put in a new project name. Tech demo, uh, it automatically populates things like the start date, and you can enter a lot of information about uh, the people and the project involved. When I save that, um, I get an open project here. Uh, if I go back to this menu and I look at the spots, there are no spots. I haven't added any spots to my data set yet. So basically, I have a blank map for an area in California. Uh, the map you can zoom in and out of uh, seamlessly. And so I'll zoom back into this area. And uh, so this is um, basically where I would start. Uh, and I would move around here. What I would want to do is I'd want to collect data in the field. And let me just start this project where I am right now in Lawrence, Kansas. So I just hit the geolocate button. And I'm just going to go, this is my location uh, in the building I'm in. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to go to this bottom part, uh, grab the point spot here, and put a spot on the map here. So I'm going to stick a spot. Whenever you add a new spot, it automatically opens up the notebook view. Uh, you get the spot name, which is just a default name. You can change any of those things and location. And then you can start entering information about it. Uh, just to show you quickly, I can delete everything here and just, for example, type office. Oops. Oops. And then if I wanted to, I can click on the uh, latitude and longitude and I can reset that, to, for example, to my location now. So you can see that the spot jumped to where my office is. So I can, I can interact with my data in that way. And I can take some notes here. So if I click on the notes field, um, I have the ability to type it in. But the other nice thing you can do uh, on most tablets is you can, you can actually start dictating what you want in your note field. I use this all the time. And this is pretty much how I take notes now. It may not get every geologic term like syncline 
or maybe it does. Anyway, I think the, the note taking this way, I take much better and much more complete notes now that I can just uh, talk through it and not have to write everything down. You can also use an Apple pencil to enter notes in if you want. And then I can just save this. So that's kind of a handy way uh, to take notes if you are have um, disabilities. Uh, this can be a, a way to get information in as well. The other thing I just want to show you at this point um, is that, for example, you can uh, take a measurement here. This is basically, well, let me close this real quick. I can bring a photo in and you can see in the upper right here that I could take a photo that brings up the camera, but I'm just going to import a photo here. This is actually a photo of my iPad sitting on the desk uh, with my office location in it. And then um, I can use this as an image base map, which means that I can map on it. If I do that, it comes in, it's georeferenced to this location. I go to image base maps on the left. Here I am with that, that photo I just took. What I can do is I can put a spot here and then I have all the spot capabilities I have anytime. So I can take a measurement. Again, this is my iPad sitting on my desk. I can set it to plain a linear measurement, planes plus linear measurements. Uh, the plane, if you line up your iPad with the surface, it gives you that orientation. If you line up the iPad also with the long axis parallel to a line or lineation, it gives you both of them at once. So right now my iPad, if I tap the compass here, uh, put the measurement in of its orientation on my desk. One of the things that, and you can also add uh, measurements manually. One of the things that we've done with a lot of the screens, again, I'm not going to go through every screen, is this ability to use templates. So you can see right underneath the PL, there's a little slider box that we have for using a temp template. And what that does is it allows you to set up a template for your measurements that you can use over and over again. So when I'm teaching field camp, uh, for example, uh, the students set up a template for their planar measurements that I do here. Uh, and if you look in the lower left here, there are no templates to define yet. I define a new template. I'm going to call this upright bedding. And there's no reason not to use long, complicated names or whatever you want. And then when I get into here, uh, I can set up the measurement aspect. So I could automatically set a measurement quality to something if I wanted. I could select, for example, that this is bedding. And this, again, we had the question about, do the students concentrate on tech or geology? If they're defining this template, they don't see any tech. All they see is information about geology. So I would enter an example, bedding, bedding type. I could say uh, sedimentary features and upright. So now I've made my uh, upright bedding template. I'll save this. And now you can see down here on the left that it's automatically populated to bedding, sedimentary feature, et cetera. So when I tap the compass, you can see my next measurement comes in with just the sedimentary feature. I'll close this now. And you can see that I've added some information there. I've added a linear feature. I haven't defined that. But the template is something that helps you save a lot of time uh, as you're going through things. All right. So I've worked on my image base map now. In the lower left here, there's a little X. I can close that. And now I still have my main spot sitting on my map, which I can go back to here. <clears throat>
I can get to my image base map by going to the three dots in the upper right. And this is basically spot actions. I can copy the spot, I can zoom to it, delete it. But the other thing is I can show nesting. And so for example, I know now that the spot on my map has a one level down from it has a photo with another spot in it, uh, or I guess, I did, yeah, another spot in it. Uh, but that spot doesn't have any sub spots underneath it. This is what we meant by the hierarchy of this being seamless. Uh, if this spot had, and I'll show you another example later, if this spot had a sample with a thin section with a chemical analysis, you could work your way all down that sequence uh, in the nest. Nesting is basically how this, the, the hierarchy of the spots work. So that's just kind of the simple part of bringing this in. Uh, down in the lowermost right, you can see this more menu. Now I said what we have here is the standard uh, Cambrian, Carrera, CC, geologic unit, the A for notes, the compass, the camera, the tags, and the sample. If I hit the more menu here, I can display, turn on, or turn off any of the pages that are in here. So I could, for example, have 3D structure or data files that I would enter in. Uh, I could have igneous uh, rocks, metamorphic rock classification uh, that I would use. And then when I go off of this, you can see now at the bottom that I've added the table with the little uh, uh, page there. The next one over is 3D structures. Uh, next one over is igneous rocks, and then the next one over is metamorphic rocks. So I can add all these sorts of things, and when I click any of these, it brings me to a quick entry modal, like this one, uh, that allows you to enter plutonic rock type. Uh, I'll just click Gabbro. Oops. Or done. I I click the done feature, and then I can I can do more classifications. How it's been modified. Uh, going back to Sneer's question, or one of the questions we had before, all of these come out of the Kobo Toolbox template builder, and these were built by these logic of going through these are built by different people. Um, to collect data. So again, I'm working with the user workflow on putting this all together. Save the rock. Okay, so this is just sort of the general interface of things you could do. Um, if I zoom out and get to another location on the KU campus, I could, for example, zoom to all the spots I have. And on this map, it's just my office spot. That's the three dot menu. And we'll get to the other menus as we go through. So any questions uh, on this sort of basic data entry at a spot navigation part? Again, you can go into the help systems and read about these, or you can go onto YouTube search on Strabo spot and, and get to it that way. Well, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna load a project. I'm gonna go back to my Strabo spot and I can start a new project with what, what I did before, or I can load a project from the server. These are my data projects that are up on the server. I'm gonna load this last one called the red pass range. And again, what it, ask me immediately is what do I want to do with this tech demo? Save it to device, upload it to the database, or just simply overwrite it. I'm going to do here the save to device. And basically what this does is it makes a backup of the entire project that I can load back in. So if I sit here, I've got this tech demo, I hit continue, it actually backs up the project. And I can also, as it shows on here, I can also export the project. Uh, that's a way if you build up for say your field camp, a whole lot of base maps and other things, you can actually export them and copy them onto multiple iPads to use. I'm just going to uh, 
continue the load here. Um, it's, oops, sorry, let me load that again. Okay, so I've loaded in this red pass project, which is actually, you see a spot list there in the notebook view, is actually in California. So I can go to the three dot menu, zoom to extent of spots, and it takes me to this area where we've collected data in the red pass range. Um, this is a part of Eastern California uh, shear zone, and it's also some Mesozoic rocks that we are looking at here. And so, for example, I'm zooming into some of the geology here. You can see strike and dip measurements of igneous and metamorphic foliations on the lower right. Um, and one thing I can do here is I can change the way the map is displayed by coloring it based on tags. And in this case, I'm doing geologic units. So what I've colored here now are different geologic units. So if I go, for example, into this spot here, open it up, you can see, um, ooh, just a second. This one here, uh, if I go into the geologic tag, you can see that it's got the tag D on it for day site. This is a meta day site unit. And if I go in and click on this, I can either add or subtract the tab. Uh, I could add multiple units. I can add multiple tags to any particular measurement. So I'm going to close this. If I then go over here and you can see under the attributes, I have spots list. This is all the spots in this project you can see. And one thing I'll have you notice is that if you look at the spot list, there are little icons. They're hard for you to see, but they tell you what kind of data are you have. So for this RP73, I have some foliation measurements. Uh, I have a geologic unit, and I have a bunch of pictures taken of that too. And it's telling me that I have that information about it in the, the menu here. But if I go back here, I see this spot like this. Going to go back and now what I want to do is go to geologic units. These are the geologic units I've defined for the area. And what I do in these is, for example, this D unit, I click on it. It tells me every spot that has that, every spot that's that geologic unit. But if you look at the upper part here, you can see the tag color. You can, oops, if I click on the tag color, I could get a palette up here where I can give it a particular color. Oops, sorry. Uh, I can give it a particular color um, that um, displays on the map here. I'm actually running one of the test versions, so that's why we had that uh, glitch with the blow up on it. This is um, like I say, we're, we're always beta testing new features and that, and that's what I'm running on this particular iPad. So this was a project, uh, I'm gonna zoom to the extent of the spots that I uh, did in California. It's actually part, it's on the Fort Irwin military base and I had to get permission to get in there. And when I was working there, I had to use their coordinate system. So what they gave me, I'll just show you now uh, is go to my account. Uh, they actually gave me a map. Uh, it's the fourth one down called Fort Irwin ITAM map. I can view that. And this is the map that they gave me to use. Um, I can zoom in on this. But the other thing I do is I can copy the code for this. If you look here, I'm, oops, I'm hitting this code button. It copies the code to the clipboard. So now I've taken a map that I've, I've defined already. I can go back to Strava spot. I can go to my section here and I can say, 
custom maps. I click on that. I'm going to add a new custom map that I'm just going to call Irwin. And I'm going to say it's from Strabo, my maps. You can also use Mapbox uh, commercial. Uh, well, it's available. It's a commercial program, but you can uh, get an account and use it for free. You can also make styles of maps and that. It actually has a, essentially Strabo, sorry, uh, Mapbox has a uh, complete GIS behind it that you can create custom maps with. But I'm just going to use this Irwin map. I can just press here and hit paste, hit save. It brings the custom map in. And now if you go by where it says Miami down at the bottom, I have the map interface here. Um, I can click on Irwin as my base map. And now you can see it's zooming to this uh, Fort Irwin map that I used, which has all of the grid coordinates and uh, things like bombing ranges and that uh, put on it as well. Anyway, so, so that's how easy it is to get a custom map that you work with. I can go back to um, my satellite map. And so I have this here. Now you can see that, um, again, this is the project colored with spots with their geologic units. I can save this map for offline use. And what this means, uh, and this is what I do whenever I'm going to a new area, you can set to different zoom levels the area you're in and you can download tiles that can be used in an offline manner. Uh, you can see now that it wants to download 8,000 tiles into this, um, which is fine. It's a lot of tiles. Uh, but I go through and I say, OK, I want to have all those different zoom levels. Uh, gives me a broad range of zooms I can use on the map. And it goes to uh, the Strava server, and it actually pulls this information, puts it together uh, from Mapbox in this case, or from Strava Spot, and it creates the data uh, here that you can download onto your map as an offline map. I'm going to go ahead and close this a few too many points. Let me just do this one to show you. I'll go and have 65 tiles. And then you can see now that it goes through and it installs them uh, very quickly. And so I can do that for anything. I can also do that, for example, with my Irwin map. When I was working there, I had a walkie talkie, but no internet connection. So I could go into these areas and um, save this map for offline use. So I'll go to 15. As long as you're not downloading 10,000 tiles, this goes fairly quickly. And now if you look over on the left side, you can see the maps in the setting and preferences, uh, manage offline maps. When I open that up, you can see that I have both Mapbox, Topo, and Satellite. And then I have this, I guess I put it, hit a T instead of an R for Irwin. And it tells you which app offline maps that you have. Uh, we had a group of students um, from KU that are working in Tibet, uh, and they would load, download hundreds of thousands of offline images uh, and map and tens of maps to work on uh, when they're in the middle of nowhere. So when they were in Kathmandu or wherever they were with internet connectivity, they'd load those and then they could use those offline. All right. Um, so I've got the spots here for this particular project. Go back to Mapbox Satellite, and then I can zoom into any place here, and I can look at the data that I added simply by clicking a spot and then opening up the, the notebook view. 
All right, I think I'll pause here for just a qu quick minute. And Ellen, are there any questions that I should answer right now in the chat? I've been trying my best to field some of them. Uh, we did have a question um, just about the images getting uploaded with the project. And the short answer is yes, when you're uploading the images to the server, or when you're uploading your project to the server, all of your images are getting uploaded there as well. Um, I think one thing to maybe note is when you're backing up a project to your device, that's saving as a project and it doesn't overwrite your previous saves to your device. Um, so you'll, if you look at your like files on like your tablet, you can see that they kind of build up. But when you're uploading these projects to the server, any database, like if you deleted something, um, it's going to then overwrite that project or that data set. All right. Any other questions? Uh, we did have a question about displaying only one conceptual tag on the map display rather than all of them at once. Um, yeah, that's not something we've we've thought about that, but that's not something we have um, built in right now. You can show different map symbols like your foliations versus bedding and stuff. Um, but right now there's no way to show that you only want X unit or Y unit. Um, you can just, yeah, kind of turn the colors off. So for example, I just turn the labels and the colors off. I could actually turn the symbols off for yeah. point measurements, most of them. Uh, I can turn off any bedding and foliation and then all I'll have left are lines on my map. So show all symbols, show all labels, show tag color for geologic units, and then I get back. So you can go in and out of these things fairly easily. Uh, if you were hunting for your data, uh, for example, in here you can get a spot list that's just in the, if you look at the top there, the reverse chronological order they are entered, just spots that are in this map extent or spots that I've viewed recently. So there's a lot of navigation in here that's built in, again, like way too much to go over in a, in a demo, but things that you can explore and, and use with this. On the backup part, um, so for example, I've got this map here, um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm going to back it up to the device. What that does is it creates a full backup of this with this particular name. And that's all it took to back up all the data. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go back to my Strapo spot. Oops. And I'm going to get projects from device. You can see these backup names that I have here. I'm going to go back to my tech demo. And I'm going to overwrite the project I have here. And it's coming in. Take it just a second here. Maybe. Hmm. Okay, we're going to get this. Sorry. Sorry about this. Let me just get this. So with the next version of iOS, it's hard. Well, okay, I guess it's got everything installed. Sorry about that. Um, now, if I go to my Zoom to extend a spots, it takes me back to my office in um, in Lawrence, Kansas. And then if I, for example, um, clicked uh, back here to my Strava spot project from device, and I go back to the project I just saved here, 
the red pass range, it's going to bring that back in. I'll let it run here for a minute to bring everything back in for that project. So it's taking a little bit of time here because it's loading photos, it's loading all these offline tiles. Uh, there's a lot of offline tiles that it's putting in um, and it's importing all of that to use again. So while it's doing this, do we have another question, Ellen? Uh, yes. Uh, how do you change your planar orientation formats, um, for example, dip, dip direction, and also um, how do you change the magnetic declination? Okay, so I'm going to zoom to extent of spots. Zoom in here. So the Strava spot compass works just like the Rick Almendinger compass. And what it does is it reads your location on the Earth, so it looks at the GPS, it knows where you are, and when you take that measurement, it automatically corrects for true north from the magnetic declination of magnetic north. So that's all built into the uh, iOS operating system. That's kind of the place where you run into problems with different Android devices and the way they handle that, but on iOS, it reads your location and it does the declination correction. If you were just making measurements with a Brunton, you would just set your Brunton and then you would take manual measurements and enter, enter those in. And if you want, uh, you can actually go into um, your project here and you can do a few notes and you can enter information there if you want as well. So you're able to enter a lot of different information in. So I've loaded this map back in now. Um, and that was basically, I've completely recovered everything from uploading the other backup. Uh, you can back up this while we're here, you can back up to device. Uh, that's a pretty safe way to back up your data. Uh, that's like um, if you have your device, um, you can back it up. And if you lose your device, uh, you've lost your data. But if you had a field book and you lost it, you would have lost your data too. One thing that you can do upon the backup is let me go ahead and, and go to backup here. I can back up this project to the device again. And now I can export it. If I do this export that I'm doing here, I actually create another file or another backup in the iOS system that then I could airdrop to a phone or I could put a, a, a card in and I could uh, copy it off that card. So basically at that point, I'm Xeroxing my map and field book. I'm saving it off to another mobile uh, electronic device. And of course, if I have any connectivity, then I can upload the project to the Strava spot server, and then it's fully uploaded. It's on the web, it's in the cloud, and, and it's maintained and backed up there. So we take backups really, really seriously and keeping data. Uh, you have several ways of backing up your data while you're in the field and when you get out of the field. And these methods work both on Android and iOS. Um, uh, yeah. Did have the question, uh, how do you change your planar orientation formats? Oh, right. Um, so let me grab a planar orientation. That's why I zoomed in here. So with our Planar orientation, you can do strike and dip or azimuth dip direction and dip. So you can uh, change it in here if you want to. When you display it, it reads whatever data you entered uh, in whatever mode. We only support strike and dip with kind of the standard right hand or rule and uh, dip direction and dip. Um, and then for we'll example, just... here, it's not good for foliation, but if I had a bedding measurement, then I could classify it as overturned upright, 
Uh, I could make a template for overturn versus upright bedding. Uh, for example, here with these planar measurements, what you're seeing there is actually uh, foliation and cleavage um, and fractures. And I had a template for fracture cleavage in this uh, project that I could use. Um, we had a question. Oh, Maddie, did that answer your question? Uh, not not quite. I, I still don't see how, how are you getting that strike and dip into a dip dip direction? Oh, OK. Um, so I'm not changing it here. That's how the data were collected. So if you collected your data from the compass, it'll enter. It. Let me just go ahead and add another data point here. Uh, it enters it in as strike and dip. But if you entered, for example, if you entered this manually and you wanted to enter your dip azimuth, um, you would simply enter in uh, 320. And you could delete the strike measurement. And it's still displaying correctly. It's just displaying in the other format. Okay, so you can't you can't make the app give you a different. We don't have the app populating both fields when it uh, collects the data. Uh, you collect it as strike and dip, uh, but that's something um, you could if you send an email with a request like that to strabospot at gmail .com, I'll get back to that in a little bit. You could have a feature request. It would be easy enough when we enter those data in to just populate that dip direction field as well. Right. So that, that's that's a feature you'll probably see soon. Thank you. We got another word of support for that feature in the chat, if that's okay. Cool. Yeah. Um, we had a question just clarifying how did you upload that map previously, your custom uh. map? Okay. How did you actually bring it into the website? Um, and how did you geo reference that map? So uh, you can, I geo reference that map uh, in um, Map Warper. Let me go to Map Warper just a second. So in Map Warper, uh, you're able to, uh, you can see rectified maps and rectified maps along this top part. You can you can rectify it in there and download a GeoTIFF, which is what I did. And then in Strabo Spot, oops, in Strabo Spot, what I did is I just added new map and I took the TIFF, georectified.tiff and I brought that into the system. So I simply selected a file on my com computer. I did this from the computer. Um, you can upload the GeoTIFFs. If you have an archive divided, provided by the USGS National Geologic Map Database, that is a zip file containing both TIFFs and TIFF uh, W or TIFF OX XML files, uh, you can bring those in as well. So that particular map was created in Map Warper and then brought straight into Strava Spot. Okay. All right. So I wanted we, we want to finish up here pretty quickly and then have some more time for questions. Um, I think the big option that we were talking about here was how to do group projects or the big question here. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make a, start a new project. Um, and I'll just call this group and save it. So you can see here that I have an active project here called group and I have project data sets underneath it. Um, I can go into these data sets and I can add and edit them. So I'm going to add one. And probably what I would do 
on this, I'm just going to add a Doug for myself. So now I have an active data set called Doug. And then I'm going to add another one. I'll call Ellen. So what I would do is while I was in the field, I would change, for me, I would change my data set to Doug. And then I would turn off the default one. I'd turn off Ellen's probably. And then I would just add data to this map. And then Ellen would log in as the same user. She would work in her data set. turn off Doug, and then she would add data for hers. At the end of the day, what we would do is each of us would upload the project to Strava Spot. It would upload it to Strava Spot, and it would put the data from that data set in. So any data that's been changed or uploaded or updated, it would add. So in that way, we would continue working in the field in our own data sets, but it would be all added to the same project and we could get it all done that way. That's how you have to do it now. It's a little kludgy. Um, we have tried to get funding to put together a, a much richer and fuller group workflow. I think um, that's our number one priority for our next funding cycle is to do exactly this, where basically all the data and all the projects can be merged together, keeping track of who did what, when, and where. Other questions? Uh, we just had a question of when you import lines from a shape file, is there a way to give them a color other than black? For the display in Strabo spot at this point, uh, the color scheme for lines is standardized based on attributes. So uh, regular contacts are black. Um, fault contacts are red, thick lines, uh, et cetera. It uses the database. It reads the symbols and the attributes. Sorry, it reads the attributes and then it puts symbols with them. Uh, you cannot change the default symbols used for uh, the different data types. So if you enter foliation, it gets a foliation symbol, bedding gets a strike and dip symbol, it set fractures get a different symbol, et cetera. And then contacts and lines uh, get a standardized symbol as well. Uh, we're talking about getting that as an enhancement to be able to display have you pick your own colors, basically, uh, but we haven't put that in yet. Yeah, I know when you like bring in polygons and stuff too, it all just gives it kind of a default color. Um, but when you're actually working in the app and like making your own polygons, um, if you give them tags, then it'll change the color um, of the polygon. And then Doug, I'm not sure if many people know how to like change to like trace features to show that a line is a Oh, okay. for contact. Um, that's a good, good point. Let's go ahead and, and do that real quick. Um, so we, we, I've shown how to add points. I'll just add a line here. I click the line tool. If I held it down longer, you can see it turns into a curvy line. I can either enter the line as uh, particular nodes or as draw a curve, but on here, for example, let me just add a set of lines here. So I've added this line, I end draw, because I've added a new spot at the notebook. And then if I put this in as a trace feature, it means it's a trace. So I can say it's known approximate, inferred, just do this as known. And again, we get context sensitive editing. So a student using this would know immediately they quality control the trace. Then they say it's a contact, a depositional contact, 
uh, between stratigraphic units, for example. So they're led through this sort of, of di uh, dialogue. If I hit save, I deselect this. You can see that it's just a, a standard black line. If I select it again and I edit the trace from known to approximate and save that, you can see that it now becomes a dashed line. So that's the default symbology that comes in. And if I were to change that one more time to a geologic structure, sorry, um, uh, geologic structure, let me just save this. Oops, go back here. Um, I could change this to another type uh, and be able to uh, symbolize it differently in that way. So this isn't changing back, so I'm not gonna worry about that right now, but you can change those things uh, as you see fit. I hope that answered the question. Uh, we had a quick question while on the lines of what lines are not trace features. Uh, if you were, for example, just uh, drawing something uh, there to outline a, a feature uh, that you weren't uh, weren't uh, giving any geology to, or you're drawing a path or something like that, uh, you could classify those differently. One thing I will show right now, um, real quick, is editing features. So I've got this feature on here and I wanna be able to edit it. If I hold down on it for just uh, a second, then I get the nodes that are on the line. If I click on a particular node, I can move it around to different positions. Or if I hold it a little longer, I can delete it. And if I wanted to, I could hold here and add a new node and redraw. So all of these features that you have, you can edit. Uh, and then I just save the edits. And now that's been put in for that particular contact now. You can do that with points, lines, and polygons. You can edit anything that you want. Um, one last thing I'll show that uh, is kind of a big time saver when I'm editing uh, features, I'm adding strikes and dips. Let me pull up a different uh, project real quick. Um, I'm gonna load this. This is a different project, another one in California. I'm gonna zoom to the extent of spots, go to a slightly different area. And I'm gonna zoom in to save spots here just to show this to you real quick. If I click on this spot DP0, that's actually the very first spot in Strabo spot. You can see I have a picture in here, but I have a lot of nested images here. So for example, under that spot, I have a couple images and then I have a close-up picture taken in one of those images that I could uh, look at. So for example, that's the close-up figure now. I can show nesting again, and then I could go up to the home spot, which is on the map. Sorry, I, I wanted to show that. What was the question again, Alan? Um, we tangented a bit from the last question, but we have a we have a new question. Um, just when working with a large group that results in multiple data sets, is there any way to merge data sets to make it easier to manage the data, like exporting, downloading the data in a single um, shape file or KMZ file? You can download um, not you can download a project together and it'll bring all the data sets in at once. So um, let me just um, I think the question is more on the exporting end. So when you're done within the app um, and you load all of the data sets onto the server, um, 
can we merge that? And right now you can only do it as downloading the individual data sets. Yeah. So this can, is where you would do that. You can view. So if you view and edit the data and data sets, you can look at all of those at once on the web browser. But if you want to like bring it into Google Earth or something, you'd have to individually download each of those data sets. Okay. So for example, let me go back here. Um, if I click over here, these are the download options. I can download data sets as shape files, which you could then combine. Uh, KMZ will bring them in as a KMZ file, so you can look at them in Google Earth. Uh, StereoNet Mobile is another option for your point data. A uh, field book is a format that I use a lot when I'm working with students. A uh, field book basically takes their entire uh, data, all their data, and it spits it out in chronological order as if it's a, a, a field book, but it integrates all the pictures and measurements, pulls all the data in together. Um, you can get different uh, shapes out as well, and you can pull out your image base maps as well if you wanted. So for example, let me just, um, I'll go back to the Red Pass range. I'm gonna pull out a KMZ um, of that, which it should give me here in a second. You can see the progress bar at top. Maybe this is too big. Okay, and then I download it. Um, if I go on my Mac now and go to my downloads folder. Uh, you can see the first file here is 6623KMZ. If I click on that, then I can see the information here. But then if I go to my iPad and go to Google Earth, uh, I can then, uh, let's see. Um, I can load that as a project. Uh, let's see. Oops, sorry. Um, let me just do this one. Yeah, so there, here we go. So here's my data that I just put in, um, that I just showed you, um, that was in Strabo spot. Now it's in Google Earth, and then I can use the full Google Earth capabilities for this data set. I can tilt it, zoom in, and do whatever I want with it at this point. So that's the sort of export facility you could have, and that works for KMZ, KML. You can field books, shape files, et cetera, but it's a data set at a time. Getting close to two and we're losing a few people, but not too many other questions. Would it be all right to ask a question just over here? Absolutely. Okay, uh, all right. So I'm really just thinking more about the collaboration, right? Because realistically, two to five years before any other setup for collaboration would exist out in public uh, for Strawberry Spot. So, uh, okay, so let's say, you know, collaborative projects that have multiple map areas for like distinct and somewhat separated field locations. Uh, okay, so like just hypothetically, it sounds like, you know, if you really want to collaborate and only on specific stuff, you just create a specific account for that project, which is easy enough to do. Uh, within there, you know, is there any reason to have multiple projects? Uh, because base maps, for example, are linked to projects, not device, right? So, right. Like, you know, is like, do things bog down when too many spots with a lot of data and photos and, and complicated base maps for that project? Does that bog down? And so you would want to have different projects for different field areas, or is that not an issue in your experience? And kind of just like, thinking through that a bit, if you have any insight to offer, it was just data sets for different people. And maybe if you want to focus down more data sets for different people in each area, you know, as long as they're like kind of close together. Yeah, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, so um, I like 
different data sets for different field areas. But if I'm working, for example, in our field camp, I have one field camp project with different areas. Um, when I've worked with students at field camp and we've collaborated, uh, we've worked on a single project and every student gets their own name and, and we just merge data together that way. Um, so I tend to, to keep things separated at the data set level um, in, in that way. The only project problem with data sets is when you're defining tags, tags are actually defined at the project level and not the data set level. So uh, you kind of have to predefine tags before you go into the field. Um, and if somebody changes a tag, it can goof things up. Everything gets backed up so you can recover what you had before, but that that's the only problem that comes in there. Um, as far as number of spots, if you have, I have data sets that have a thousand spots in them and they're, they perform fine. Uh, when you start to get 10,000, 5,000, 10,000 spots in a single uh, fell swoop, then it can get a little doggy. And, and so I guess thinking about tags is kind of the, Litho stratigraphic column, the kind of correlation of map units side of things. Essentially, as long as even geographically distinct and somewhat separated field areas share a broad stratigraphy that can be tied together or geologic framework to generalize it more, then the same project should work fine. It's only when you really are thinking, hey, uh, and I don't know, we haven't seen Strabo said, but I don't think that there's a way to relate correlate different stratigraphic charts yet essentially you know to like marry two frameworks or have them be equivalent and for strabo spot to know to map that in strabo spot at this time no um, no you'd have to you'd have to establish a regional stratigraphy again with um students at our field camp most of the areas have a well-defined paleozoic stratigraphy and mesozoic stratigraphy they work with uh, we do do one project, week-long projects, where they have to define all the units from scratch. For that particular one, it would not work uh, to have them all collaborating and defining those units. We'd have to have some kind of arbitration uh, in out of the field or with connectivity to be able to do that. Okay. Other... Anybody speak up? Other questions? All right. Well, I think what we'll do then is um, I'm going to stop the demo at this point. Um, and that's basically what we had uh, set for you today. We'll do a quick intro on Thursday, short version of the first PowerPoint, and more time in Strabo said. Uh, looking at and collecting data. And that's 12 to 2 on Thursday. Uh, anybody who wants to stay online at this point, answer, ask any questions, that's great. Uh, formal presentations more or less is done now, and but I'll answer any questions people have or Ellen can answer uh, those as well. I'm glad to see everybody showing up, uh, some familiar names and some new names. So that's cool. Okay. Well, hopefully you're going to continue or if continue using Strabo Spot if you're using it. And if you're not, you're going to start adopting its usage. I really, I, I think for me, the big thing is one of those first slides I showed where I really want to use everything I can possibly use in the field uh, to do the field geology better. And whether that's having 20 different base maps that show different things or, um, you know, taking thousands of strikes and dips uh, very quickly, um, whatever it is with that, that's, that's what I want to be able to do. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. Just got a question that will upload this video to the Strabo Spot webpage. Yeah, we'll put it on the YouTube and then on the help page on Strabo Spot. Yep.
thanks for asking that so I can remember to stop recording. Okay, well, thank